this week on Q&A. Our guest is Brody Mullins of the Wall Street Journal. As the journal's investigative reporter, he writes about taxpayer-funded trips for members of Congress, as well as the current rules on political action committees. Brody Mullins of the Wall Street Journal, I have in front of me a whole bunch of stories you have written over the last several years I want to ask you about. I'm just going to go through them. First of all, before I ask you about the first one, mm -hmm. define your job at the Wall Street Journal. Well, I consider myself uh, an investigative reporter, um, but really what I try to do is sort of look for um, kind of the, the, the bad stories in Washington, people doing things that are legal but shouldn't be, or people who are uh, sometimes breaking the law but often sort of pushing up against the law. Um, I don't really have a, an exact definition. I sort of look for stories that if people picked up and read them, they would say, you know, that's, that's wrong. And how long have you been doing that at the Wall Street Journal? Uh, five years at the Wall Street Journal. I was at Roll Call for a couple years before then where I was trying to, uh, trying to get into that sort of mold of, of, of a reporter. Let me go back to March 31st, 2006. Lots of people in this town talk about this story to this day. And it has to do with somebody named Emily Miller. Mm -hmm. give, us the, uh, give us the beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the sort of the, the heart of the Jack Abramoff scandal. Uh, Jack Abramoff was a, a big-time Republican lobbyist back in the back in the day, or really just uh, five or six years ago. Um, he uh, made a lot of money uh, from clients, uh, telling them how influential he was with uh, with Republicans on Capitol Hill, uh, particularly with Tom Delay. He, um, in order to get in get in good with the Delay crowd, he uh, hired a bunch of people out of Delay's office. He uh, brought delay staffers to football games, to baseball games, to concerts. He opened up a, a restaurant, um, a sushi restaurant that became one of the most popular places for young Republicans to go out at night. Um, there was a rumor that that uh, that if you were in, if you were a Capitol Hill staffer, you got a nice discount when you went to his his restaurant. So he really used all the tools that he could to get in uh, good with these delay staffers and other Republican staffers who could really make things happen for him. Um, when he started going really over the line, he uh, uh, started flying staffers uh, overseas for, for luxurious golf trips uh, in Scotland. He uh, had a, uh, a, a Gulfstream jet he would fly people around with. So well, there's a lot of people on the inside of government who really owed Jack Abramoff. And he's and currently in prison. He's currently in prison. He's actually getting out, getting out pretty soon. Um, but um, Emily Miller... Uh, and um, Tony Rudy and Michael Scanlon were three of the sort of mid-level staffers in his office who all got in this sort of weird relationship where um, Emily Miller uh, started dating uh, Michael Scanlon. Uh, they ended up um, uh, separating, uh, and ap about the time they were separating, um, uh, Abramoff was, was being pursued by prosecutors and uh, prosecutors <clears throat> went to her to sort of get some of the inside information about uh, who knew who, who, you know, who, who was in charge of, of what, what were the overlapping relationships. So she, she ended up sort of being a, a helpful source for the Justice Department as they pursued, um, as they pursued uh, Abramoff. But you tell the story about how Michael Scannon all of a sudden had these big houses and how they were engaged out in the West Coast and they were going to have a right. beach wedding. Right. And all of a sudden, at the last minute, there was a 24-year-old waitress. I was, that got I was trying to stay away from the seedy side of the, uh, <laughs> of the story. Yeah, but I mean, the reason I, I bring it up in the, the, your first story is because you suggest, there's a paragraph here, prosecutors came to Ms. Miller to help them build a case that drove her ex-fiance to plead guilty, according to a person familiar with the situation. So right. Did she play a big role in this, you think? I think she, I think she played an important behind-the-scenes role. I don't think that she went to prosecutors and said, "Here's all the documents. You know, here's all the dirt. Here's what they did wrong." She has said to this day that she did not know of wrongdoing. Um, but what she did know is that she was dating uh, or engaged to one of Abramoff's uh, lobbying uh, employees uh, at the time. Uh, that employee, uh, Michael Scanlon, was 27, 28, 29, 30 years old. And he's driving around in great cars. He had a seventeen or was it seventeen thousand dollar a month apartment at the Ritz Carlton in D.C. He owned a, a couple of beach houses in St. Bart's in the Caribbean. He said he had a private jet. 
Um, he had a whole number of beautiful houses out on the eastern shore. So she saw that he was making a ton of money. And she could, I think, sort of sniff wrongdoing. You know, 27-year-olds or 30-year-olds are not supposed to have that kind of money. And if they are, there might be something wrong going on. What's your take, though? <laughs> Here we are years later after your 2006 story. Michael Scanlon has been has pled guilty but has not been sentenced. <clears throat> and Tony Rudy pled guilty and had not been sentenced. And Abramoff is in jail and, as you say, may come out soon. I'm, it depends on whether he gets out on good behavior or not, but he could be there till 2012, and he could go back if he's convicted of other crimes that are mm -hmm. supposedly. Uh, but why? what's going on here with this story? That, that's a really good question. Uh, the prosecution seems to have been stalled for two or three years now. Um, the, the, the shame in it, I think, is that prosecutors were going after Abramoff, and they got him. They're going after Tom DeLay. Um, they, they, they don't seem to have gotten him, so Mr. DeLay himself may have never done anything wrong. Uh, they got Bob Ney to plead guilty. He, he was a former member of Congress who went in and out of jail. He's now out of jail. Um, and then who they've really rung up, all the people who have pled guilty and all the people who are, have prosecutions hanging over them or, or jail terms hanging over them are all these 20-year-old staffers in Mr. DeLay's office. So it seems like prosecutors were going for the big fish, and they ended up netting a whole bunch of smaller fish. Um, and a lot of these guys, you know, have, have families. They, clearly, they made mistakes. They were younger. And now they're walking around with no chance of getting a job in D.C. Um, they have uh, pled guilty but have not yet been sentenced. So they're sort of walking around not knowing, you know, when and if they'd go to jail. Meanwhile, I consider them sort of the smaller players. The big guys, the, the Tom DeLays, uh, have, have never been charged with anything. So... Go back to this story. Can you remember how you originally learned about this? Yeah, well, it's actually a, a good example of how I think D.C. works and how journalism works in D.C. Um, you know, if you work for, for uh, you know, if you're just getting your start in journalism, you're younger, you're making friends with staffers on Capitol Hill, with lobbies on Capitol Hill, you know, everyone's in the same, their same age group, in their 20s, in their 30s, um, uh, single or just married, don't have kids. You know, you see people on the weekends, you see people at, at, at night, and you sort of make friends, you make relationships. Because I'm a reporter, I can help them, they're Capitol Hill staffers, they can help me. So you sort of, you, you learn what people are, are like outside of the office. And, you know, you have a party and you invite them and you go to their parties. And so there's always, so you sort of, I knew the relationships um, within the office. I knew that Emily Miller had dated... Uh, Michael Scanlon. I knew that Michael Scanlon had left the office and worked for Abramoff, and that's just something that I knew about. So when the scandal, um, when when Abramoff was first uh, charged, or when the Washington Post first broke the stories about Abramoff, uh, you know, I sort of knew that piece of information, and I sort of started I started mining that thread because it seemed like that could it just seemed like an interesting relationship there. Did she talk to you at that time? No. And since then, Michael Scanlon married that 24-year-old waitress. I right. And they're out in uh, out in the Eastern Shore. I think they're probably taking a little hit on all their real estate holdings, given the uh, the market. But overall, Michael Scanlon has, the, has been the big winner. Was there a lesson in this whole Abramoff story? <laughs> we now have a documentary that's mm -hmm. out. Uh, we also have a movie with Kevin Spacey coming out later. Right. Casino Jack. Right, right. Um, I, I think the only lesson has been for staffers to, to watch out. Um, a lot of the rules that were in place before are similar to the rules that are in place now. The rules now are a little stricter, but people just didn't follow them. Um, young staffers would get to, a, would be hired on Capitol Hill. They would sort of do what everyone else did. And before there was a rule that said you couldn't accept more than $50 in, a, in, in gifts, you know, meaning like drinks or, or meals or sports tickets. And people would routinely exceed that limit. Um, and that's just, that was just the culture. That's the way it was. Now that these guys have been prosecuted and some are going to jail and some are walking around with these, uh, you know, guilty pleas, uh, people know that there are consequences. I think that's been the real lesson. We moved to August 28th, 2007. Mm -hmm. The headline on your story was, Big Source of Clinton's Cash is an Unlikely Address. And the dr address is Dale, mm -hmm. Daly City, California. Were you, right. Did you go there? I went out there. Yeah, this, this was a, a really uh, a fun story, actually, for, for everyone except for the, the guy I was writing about. Um, so, so I got a, 
a tip uh, a couple of months before then that it seemed like um, there was one big donor to Hillary Clinton who was getting his money from, from some very odd places. So uh, at issue was this family called uh, the, the Pa family, who were Chinese immigrants who lived out in Daly City in California, which is, a, which is a, uh, an immigrant suburb of San Francisco. Um, and so I went through FEC records, and I was looking for what addresses in the country, what houses or buildings were the biggest sources of campaign cash to any candidates. You mentioned before you go anywhere, <coughs> FEC right. records, and uh, is that available to everyone? Right. That's a Federal Election Commission. Uh, it's the agency that, that watches over uh, campaign finances. Uh, FEC.gov is the website. Uh, anyone can go there. It's, it's fairly easy to navigate. Uh, anyone can go there and try to look up who uh, is donating to uh, which candidates. So this is, the you say, the Paw family, P-A-W. P-A-W. In Daly City, California. And right. somebody, though, tipped you off that this was happening. Right. And so would that somebody be somebody... I, it, <laughs> no, no, let me just take it for... Would that be somebody who was against Hillary Clinton? Yes. Okay, go ahead. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with getting a... a almost every tip you get is from someone who has an agenda. You know, there, there, there are very few nice people who walk around and say, hey, I have this great story that you should write. You know, everyone has an agenda, and as long as you know what their agenda is, and as long as the facts are right, you know that's a story that you can write about. Um, reporters need to be very careful of getting tips and not fully checking them out, and writing stories that turn out not to be true, because uh, everyone in this town wants something, uh, and uh, so you know you, reporters always need to be, be careful. So this one, I, I fully vetted it, and what I did was I, I figured out who. Uh, again, the top sources of the top addresses of, that were giving money, and I don't remember for sure, but one was you know some wealthy uh, Manhattan um, uh, property owner uh, who had given thousands of dollars, but he was he was one of the richest guys in New York. Another one was the the owner of a professional basketball team. Um, another one was a, a big real estate owner in uh, Oakland. So really rich people were giving a lot of money. That makes sense. Fourth on the list was this Paw family. So they live in a, in a one-story, I think seven-bedroom, 1,500-square-foot uh, house uh, that was, uh, which was listed about the time I looked, uh, about $300,000 or so. And they'd given about $100,000 in campaign contributions. So anyone who hears that knows that there's something fishy going on. Luckily, the Wall Street Journal agreed. I had a great editor at the time uh, named Monica Langley, who once I told her that information, she said, get on the next plane to San, to San Francisco. So I grabbed a bag, went out to San Francisco, rented a car, and uh, pulled up in front of the house at uh, 11 o'clock or midnight that night. It was actually kind of spooky because the, the, uh, the fog was rolling in. I was in a neighborhood I wasn't sure. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't know exactly where it was. And, um, and as soon as you look at the house, you knew that there was a problem. You knew someone was breaking the law or, or at least you know, trying to pull a fast one. Again, how much money had they given that you found? I think it was $120,000. How that many this, candidates? That this family had given. Um, it was to several dozen candidates, but I think it was, um, it, it, but it was a, at least 100000 to Hillary Clinton herself over some period of time. So most of the money was going to Hillary Clinton. Some was going to other candidates. So to make a, a, a long story short, what I found out is that this family really didn't have any money. Um, they were uh, uh, friends and acquaintances with this guy, Norman Shu, who was a big Hillary fundraiser. And that Norman Shu was uh, essentially funneling money through this family to Hillary Clinton and to other candidates. A, um, under campaign finance law, an, an, an individual can only give so much uh, of their own money to a candidate. You know, one way around that, an illegal way, is for me to give you money, and then you give money to a candidate, and then I can sort of, you know, I can double the amount of money that I'm giving. That's illegal, and that's what he was doing. You have a paragraph that says the 2002 law also raised penalties for infractions and included the prospect of prison sentences for offenders for the first time. That increased incentives by the Federal Election Commission and federal prosecutors to investigate and prosecute infractions. 
Since the law was enacted, the FEC has collected millions of dollars in fines for illegal <coughs> donations, including its largest ever penalty, a $3.8 million levy against Freddie Mac last year. Mm -hmm. Again, this story was in 2007, but if you go back to when the uh, I understand the penalty came in 2001 <coughs> for Freddie Mac. Mm -hmm. and at the time, Rahm Emanuel was on that board of directors. That's right. Because he was appointed by Bill Clinton in 2000. That's right. So what did you, and, and that is not, I don't, I say that only because they don't do that like they used to when they used to have some members appointed by mm -hmm. uh, the company itself, Freddie Mac, and some by mm -hmm. the politicians. But mm -hmm. what did you see? What's the lesson from this story? Um, I think the, the lesson to me was that, um, you know, there were more and more people giving money to uh, campaigns, to presidential campaigns, to, to regular campaigns. Um, the amount of money donated to politics uh, just goes up and up and up every year. Um, and there is a lot of wrongdoing. Um, I mean, this was one of Hillary Clinton's top campaign fundraisers. Hillary Clinton was was no unknown presidential candidate. I mean, she was the, at the time, she was the presumptive Democratic nominee uh, running against some guy named Barack Obama. And um, and she had a guy, you know, breaking the law right at the top of her campaign. Now, uh, Mrs. Clinton's fundraisers and staff said that they didn't know that, that he was, that this fundraiser was breaking the law. And I agree with them. But um, the point is that if someone can uh, flout the campaign finance laws right up in one of the most important campaigns and the most important candidates in recent history. Uh, it's, it's probably happening all the time. This is from April the 1st, 2009. It's not that long ago. Mm -hmm. And the headline is U.S. News, <clears throat> colon, lawmakers have long rewarded their aides with bonuses. And in this case, you use something called Legistorm. You use the Federal <coughs> Elections Commission site in the last one. Mm -hmm. What's uh, Legistorm? Mm -hmm. Uh, Legislorm is a uh, website started by a former uh, reporter named Jock Friedley, uh, who you probably know. He worked at The Hill for many years, uh, left and founded his own website. There's a bunch of uh, people in D.C. Who, who have an interest in, in getting more, shining uh, a greater spotlight on the activities of Congress and campaign finances. Uh, Jock Friedley is one of them. Uh, his website uh, makes it easier for people to figure out, uh, sort of track the money within Congress. Um, not uh, what Congress is appropriating money for, not big spending projects, but, but literally how much a committee is spending on running the committee, how much a congressional office spends on flowers, on transportation, on the, the TVs that they buy, and on staff salaries. What's the source for him for that? Well, all this information is out there. I mean, uh, the House and Senate, um, at the time, I think it was every three months, had to uh, publish all this information in these really thick binders. In fact, I think it's there were probably one quarter's worth of information, probably was about uh, six or seven phone books worth of information. So the information was there. And this is a but, company, Legistorm, that's under storming media, I believe, I think so, yeah. which goes and gets government information, which is right. free to them, and they publish it right. and then charge for it. Right. So a lot of the, a lot of the when you uh, complain to Congress about the lack of uh, public information, a lot of times they say, look, the information is there. You just need to go to this office and sit in this room and go through these binders. What Jock does is take that information and put it on the web. So in, in this story that you wrote on April 1st of 2009, 200 House members awarded bonuses of $9.1 to more than 2,000 staff people. Uh, what got your attention on this? The, the, I think it's perfectly acceptable for, for uh, lawmakers to give bonuses to staffers on the Hill. What was interesting, and, and, and reporters and people on the Hill knew that staffers get bonuses at the end of the year. What, what made this a story is that this was right at the time when uh, lawmakers were criticizing uh, all the big auto companies and all the big financial services companies for giving bonuses to their staffers. So they were saying, uh, or to themselves, you know, and obviously those Wall Street bonuses are in the millions. Um, but it just struck me as a little bit disingenuous when a member of Congress blames a, a CEO for flying around in a corporate jet and spending a lot of money and rewarding all the staff with bonuses when they were doing the same thing. I mean, the, the dollar amounts are significantly smaller, um, but it just seemed like a piece of information that we should put out and have the public decide. Here's uh, 
a paragraph from your story that talks about the rationale from the Congress's standpoint. Most aides could make more money elsewhere but choose to work on Capitol Hill because they believe in public service, said Brendan Daly, a spokesman for House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, a California Democrat who, along with other top House leaders, awarded bonuses. Senators also give bonuses, but documents showing those bonuses aren't yet available. Mr. Daly said bonuses are a small perk for underpaid government employees. Let me go back to that statement that Mr. Daly made that um, the reason they work on Capitol Hill is because they believe in public service. What's your take on that? What do you think after watching it for these years? I, and for the most part, I, I agree. It, 99% I agree. I think there are some people, just like in any workplace, who game the system. Uh, but I think that 99% of people who work on Capitol Hill, and I think that 99% of lawmakers are good people trying to do the right thing. They may disagree on what the right thing is or how to accomplish the right thing, um, but but I think that most people are are are, um, are 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 trying to help the country. Let me ask you about this paragraph near the end of your story. Last fall, Democratic Representative Tom Udall left the House to run for New Mexico's Senate seat, which he eventually won. Several members of his House staff took leaves from their government jobs to work <clears> for his campaign. When Mr. Udall won the race and returned to Washington, his office budget had accrued a large surplus. He decided to spend the surplus funds by increasing salaries for nearly his entire staff for a short time. Isn't this really basically saying you're leaving the staff to campaign for me? I'll take care of you if I win afterwards by not spending the money while you're running for office. So in mm -hmm. effect, the law that says you can't work in the campaign when you're in the office is really not working. Yes. Um, the Udall example was the most extreme example we, we had in the story. Uh, other examples were, uh, you know, people working for the entire year and then, you know, getting a couple thousand bucks at the end of the year. Um, you know, as a lot of people get it, you know, the, the Christmas bonus that a lot of people get. Uh, the Udall case was a little bit different. That seemed to be pushing the line a little bit more. It's still entirely legal, but, but as you, you know, you explained well that you're, you're, you're pushing the, the line there. Next story, May 6, 2009, and the headline on this is U.S. News, colon, some PACs run after politicians drop out, PACs, political action committees, mm -hmm. neither retirement nor electoral defeat stop spending on the personal terms, and you start right out by telling a story about the late Representative Paul Gilmore. Explain. Yeah, this is a, a fascinating area. I, I said at the beginning that the stories I like covering the best, stories I like writing about the most are things that are legal but clearly should not be. This story is about something that's entirely, le entirely legal, which is uh, members of Congress who have leadership packs, which is basically a special political kitty that members of Congress have, and about how people, how those lawmakers spend the money um, out of that fund. I in these leadership packs, a lawmaker can spend money however they want. I mean, literally, you're allowed to pay for your mortgage out of your leadership pack. Um, and um, what we found out is that after members of Congress retire, if they still have money in those leadership packs, they, they carry them on as sort of a personal bank account as they move forward. In our lead example here, we had a guy named uh, Paul Gilmore, from, a Republican from Ohio, uh, who died, I think, in September of that year. And when he died, there's 20,000, 30,000 or so left in his leadership pack. Well, interestingly, uh, as uh, Mr. Gilmore was not around, PAC receipts show that the PAC kept spending money. Now, no one in Gilmore's office ever explained exactly who was spending that money, but clearly someone in his office had the PAC credit card. And the expenses that we saw, there, none of them were huge, but it was, it was um, uh, expenses that you would typically see of a sort of a 20 or 30 year old uh, staffer on the Hill. It was. Domino's Pizza and Subway for lunch and cab rides home and a couple of bar tabs and all you know all places on Capitol Hill where staffers go. So, <clears throat> so <clears throat> one of his staffers had just you know taken the the credit card and used it as a personal bank account. Let, let me uh, you quote at the end of your article mm -hmm. a fellow by the name of Ryan Walker, uh, and you say he's an aide who managed the pack. Mm -hmm said staff members, quote, gathered many times as we were all grieving to help each other with the job search process, unquote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what was your reaction when you heard that? Uh, my reaction was, uh, let's let the readers decide what they think about that explanation. <laughs> There's more in, in this story about individual people. Um, one of them is a fellow named 
uh, Jack Quinn. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember that. Spent mm -hmm. two thousand nine hundred thirty-six dollars at uh, Wojner's Flower Shop in Lackawanna, New York, in the past two years. Mm -hmm. um, it was politically related. Mr. Quinn said in an interview, "I didn't go out and buy my wife a dozen roses on her birthday." Mm -hmm. Was he in Congress when he spent that? No, he he was a, a year or two out of Congress. Uh, he was a, 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 a um, working at a, a school, a, a university in uh, Buffalo, and he um, he said the flowers were were for political supporters. If he ever had a political supporter, someone who voted for him, or someone who worked on his campaign who passed away, or had someone in their family who passed away, he would go out and buy them flowers for the funeral. Let's go back and and, and try to get to the bottom. Of this. If you're a congressperson, you get a pack. And there's a limit to it. I mean, you explained that like the Paul family earlier. There's a limit to how much money you can accept. And what is that limit on a yearly basis now? Well, it, it changes every year. At the time, it was $4,600 for your personal re-election account. That's the one they used to, to run for re-election. And then separately, it's $5,000 a year or $10,000 for the entire uh, election cycle in your in your um, in your leadership pack. So literally, so if I, two separate, and, and then you have the leadership pack. pack different. So if I'm a yeah. person in Congress, I could say to X Y Z Corporation or X Y individual, give me money here, but also give me money over here. I'm much more restricted in this one. I'm much less restricted right. in that one. And I can take all of that pack money with me when I leave. Right. Can and and how many of them end up spending it when they become lobbyists on other members of Congress? That's a good question. The, we've, we've we've seen a bunch of people do that, maybe a few dozen, and, and and I honestly think that that is okay. That was sort of the purpose of it. If you're a member of Congress, and you get uh, you leave Congress with ten thousand dollars in your pack, and you go and you, and you and you work in the private sector, even if you're a lobbyist, if you're taking that money and donating it back to a member of Congress. That's sort of the intended purpose of a PAC. Yeah, but what if I'm the guy that contributed <laughs> to you because I thought you were going to be in Congress? Yeah, that's that's a good. And all of a sudden, that. you're contributing to somebody over here I don't even like. That is certainly possible. Let me go back to your story. And the two years since former Representative Oxley, and he's it's longer than that now, mm. uh, retired. His PAC spent seventy nine thousand dollars on travel, lodging, meals, and Broadway tickets, including a ski trip to Vail, Colorado. That cost more than twenty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Did you ask Mr. Oxley about this? Yeah, we spoke with, uh, I spoke with Mr. Oxley or an aide of his, I don't remember which. Mark um, uh, Braden, a lawyer right. for the PAC. So okay. And uh, Mr. Oxley, when he was a member of Congress, had a annual fundraising event in Vail where all the big lobbyists would go out and, and ski with Mr. Oxley and pay five or $10,000 uh, for the privilege. And uh, Mr. Oxley retired and once he retired, he figured he'd still have this, this ski trip. He, I guess he thought it was a lot of fun. He could raise money for his pack. Uh, you know, members of Congress still like having this political kitty once they leave Congress. So he was still trying to raise money for it so he could, uh, you know, give money back to candidates or do whatever he wanted to do with it. So, he, so the point of the, the $20,000 expenditure in Vail is that he was trying to, it was a fundraiser. He wanted to raise money for his pack. From the public standpoint, <clears throat> how, how much, how closely can they, through you or through themselves, track what they spend pack money on um it, well it, a part of the problem with disclosure on capitol hill is that sometimes they disclose so much information that it's too much information to figure out um a, anyone can go to um the fec's website again fec.com federal election commission and look up someone's pack and then through that go through reports to see how money is spent it can be difficult to it's a lot of information. Another quick way of doing it is, is to go to the Center for Responsive Politics, which is opensecrets.org. They have a pretty good breakdown of, of PACs. And they're independent of the Congress. Center yes. for Responsive Politics. Yeah, they're We've a nonpartisan organization. And you quote <coughs> Melanie Sloan a lot. We've had her here as a guest. Why yeah. do you quote her a lot? Uh, that's a good question. I, I quote her a lot for, for uh, a, couple of, a couple of reasons. Uh, the main reason is she is um, a former prosecutor. Uh, she is uh, on the left. She's left of center. She 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 is a Democrat, um, but she also I think she's honest in criticizing Democrats a lot. Um, there's a lot of nonpartisan or people who say they're nonpartisan in organizations who who are actually slanted on the right or the left. Um, in Washington, you can get anyone to say anything. So it, when you're you're trying to find a um, a source, someone to quote. 
uh, a good government uh, watchdog group who, who really is nonpartisan. And even though she's to the left of center, I think she's always been professionally right on, down, right down the middle. Um, so when you're criticizing with something that Democrats do, you sort of want to get someone who, uh, who would be less likely to want to criticize them. July 2nd, 2009, your story. Congress travels, Congress's okay. travel tab swells. Spending on taxpayer-funded trips rises tenfold from Italy to the Galapagos. And you start off by saying, spending my lawmakers on taxpayer financed trips abroad has risen sharply in recent years. A Wall Street Journal anal analysis of travel records shows. Is that you doing the analysis? No, I, I had a, uh, at the time, a, uh, a good friend at the Wall Street Journal named Tim Farnham, who's now at the Washington Post, who was basically our researcher at the journal. Um, he is one of those guys who can, can get into some data, set up computer programs, and somehow spit out numbers that I wouldn't have any idea how to come up with. Is that that um, one email I saw yes. that we got from you where it shows, <laughs> right. is that the algorithm? That, I think it's the algorithm. That was part of the computer program that he used to put, to, to put together this chart. But the average person couldn't figure that I out. I have no idea what that chart means. Where did he go after the figures for this travel story? Uh, where did he go after? Yeah, where do you find them? Where are the, where are the figures? Oh, um, so, the, so Congress is required to disclose uh, within 30 days or sometimes 90 days, um, a, a very basic set of information about where they travel. And they're required to put that in the congressional record. Now, the congressional record is a, a phone book size um, uh, uh, record of, of everything that happened in Congress the day before. So every few days, there'll be a single page put into that about you know, the, the trips that happened in the previous period. So what Tim had to do was go through millions of pages of documents to find all the travel records and to pull them out and put them into a spreadsheet. Now you and I would have started three years ago and just started flipping through those pages one at a time and we'd still be doing it. Tim was able to set up some sort of computer program on his own uh, with that algorithm that I showed you that, um, that, would, that could do that automatically. That would go through um, websites and pull out just the travel forms. You, um, let me just to give uh, those listening a flavor of the kind of thing you have in the article. In mid-June, Sen Senator Daniel in no way of Hawaii led a group of a half dozen senators and their spouses on a four-day trip to France for the biannual Paris Air Show. An itinerary for the event shows that lawmakers flew on the Air Force's version of a Boeing 737, which cost $5,700 an hour to operate. They stayed at the Intercontinental Paris Le Grand Hotel, which advertises rooms for $460 a night. Later, you say a spokesman for Mrs. Pelosi says that she was working in Italy, meeting with U.S. troops at Aviano Air Base, laying a wreath at the Florence American Cemetery, giving a speech to Italian lawmakers, and visiting the Pope among other things, and that was an eight-day trip uh, that you say was spouses and aides mm -hmm. that uh, spending 57697 mm -hmm. on hotels and meals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, w this series of stories was about the huge increase in travel that members of Congress are doing overseas. Um, and, you know, the, the world is changing. Um, uh, members of Congress are involved more and more in international politics. Uh, economies are more and more aligned as we're seeing right now. I mean, our stock market is crumbling because there's some, you know, there's a problem in Greece. Um, so, you know, economies are, are aligned. There's more trading between countries, and it's important for members of Congress to go overseas and to meet with uh, lawmakers, uh, lawmakers over there. What we found though is that a lot of these trips are bogus. That you say you're going on some, you know, good government trip, but then you're bringing your spouse. Uh, you're partying a lot, you're staying in expensive hotels, you're flying on government planes, um, and they're pretty fancy trips. Uh, you know, I've, I've gone on a, on a whole bunch of work trips myself, and I've never brought uh, my wife, and I think it's because my wife wouldn't like it. As soon as I'm going on a trip where I'm bringing my wife, I'm probably not working that hard. You say in this story, in October, Representative Bud Kramer spent two weeks in Europe on government business. Reports show that Mr. Kramer spent $5,700 on hotels and meals and incidentals. Mr. Kramer wasn't running for re-election and left office just two months later. Quote, knowing that I was leaving with, an, with my 18 years of seniority, I wanted to conclude 
some issues that I was working on, unquote. Mr. Kramer said he now works for a lobbying firm in Washington. How can you do that? That is entirely legal. You know, I said that there's a good reason for members of Congress to travel. But if you are retiring or have retired or lost re-election, there's just no reason that the taxpayer should be paying for you to travel. You seem to find a lot of that where they... It happens all the time. And do you call them and ask them about it? And when you do, how many, have, how often when you call somebody, they, they, they're they not available? How often would you say? 50% uh, of the time. No, the advantage that the Wall Street Journal has that other papers don't have is that I can wait people out. Um, we started calling people uh, for these stories in May. And the most recent story, May of 2009, the most recent story that came out on this was uh, March of 2010. And so, you know, it, someone cannot be available for a while, but if we're calling every week for months, we're eventually going to get people. And if we really need to talk to someone, we can just go up to Capitol Hill and track them down. One of the sources mm -hmm. you use, and you were talking about your, your uh, fellow to help you with some research, right. is the clerk's site in the House of Representatives? Right. How does that work, and can the average person go in there? Yeah, yeah, that's a good site for the average person. The, the, uh, the clerk's website in the House, uh, the, the Senate does not have a similar version, uh, puts up uh, on a semi-regular basis every week or so. They'll pull a couple pages from the congressional record where those travel reports are. Now, again, they're, they're not searchable. You can't type in the name of your member of Congress and see what trips they've gone on, but you can you can go through these filings and uh, and and basically put together, you know, see what some of these reports look like. Let, let's kind of recap the kind of things that are available. You, you talked about the Federal Election Commission site, mm -hmm. which is public information. Right. That's all the expenditures on the campaign. Right. How I went in there this morning and I couldn't find anything on the current election. I typed in the two people running against each other in my home state of Indiana and there was nothing there. Really? Just typed their names, and I could not find Dan Coates Senate or Brad Ellsworth. Uh, well, there's a the problem. Uh, in House forms, uh, when, when a lawmaker runs for the House, their uh, financial forms need to be filed in electronic version, basically emailed in, and they go right up on the FEC's website. Senators uh, file their, their filings in paper form. So you'll get these thousand-page documents that the senators drop off to an office in the Senate, the Senate then takes them and makes a copy of them and brings them to the FEC. The FEC can't put them on their website until they scan every single page into, um, onto their website. Okay, we're in the middle of the year right now. When do they have to file, when do they and go through the process? If somebody spends a dollar in that Indiana Senate race out there, when is the first time I can find it, that on the FEC? It should be every, every quarter after they've announced that they're running. Um, so the most recent forms covered January, February, in March, and those forms came out in mid-April. Uh, we're now waiting for the second quarter, which ends June 30th. Those forms will come out in uh, in the middle of July. But that last quarter before you, when you're running, you don't see that till the campaign's over. Right. Uh, the other thing on the list we talked about this earlier was crew, the Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics, Melanie S Sloan's operation, mm -hmm. Legistorm, which you have to pay for that information. I don't think so. I think it's free. You just have to register. Yes. And that basically is what? That is uh, Congress's internal spending, staff, staff salaries, uh, committee expenditures, TVs, rugs, flowers. And when you get on the House thing, it's you go through the clerk.gov? Right. You have to go to the, you go to the, the house.gov, and then within that you look for uh, the clerk's um, page. And we talked about the Wall Street Journal analysis that you had your your uh, researcher help you on. Right. The other thing was the Freedom of Information Act that you cite periodically. Right. How, is, how, is that, how does that work? Right, that's a good question. So a lot of the information we got on the travel stories were uh, information we got from the Freedom of Information Act, uh, which allows reporters, or actually any member of the, of the public, to file a request for internal documents from government agencies. Uh, interestingly, uh, Congress has exempted itself from this law, so you can't ask Congress uh, for internal documents, but you can ask other government agencies. So for our travel stories, uh, we went to members of Congress and said, um, hey, you know, we saw that you went on this trip, give us some information about it, and they would say, 
uh, no, basically. So we then sent these Freedom of Information Act requests to the agencies or to the military, because the military flies the members of Congress, so they would have, they would have the records. Um, about six months later, we started getting those documents. So the, the, this information takes a, a long, long, long time to, to get. But as I said, at the Journal, we can sort of wait people out. Um, we also try to get information from the State Department. The State Department runs all overseas trips because of the State Department. And, you know, they coordinate with foreign embassies and, and the like. And, um, and just last week, I got a letter from them saying that they had received my, uh, actually Tim Farnham, my, my colleague, they had received our uh, Freedom of Information Act request that we wrote to them in June and that they have uh, put it in the, 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 the queue. They've deemed it to be a complicated uh, request and that they'll get back to us shortly. So 11 months after we sent them a letter, they said, we've gotten your letter. We'll get back to you at some point. What would you say to the premise that if a member of Congress or a member of the Senate wants to bury this information, or wants to make it difficult, or the institutions want to make it difficult, they can and do. They do. And and do you, do you ever ask anybody why they make it so difficult to get this information? Uh, I I don't ask them, but it, it seems clear. I mean, a lot of these information, the, a lot of this information, are things that they don't want out there. Um, you know, it's it's. I can say that I that I understand why a member of Congress would want to go overseas to go to a conference or go meet with a foreign leader or go meet with troops. Um, but what if you're the hometown newspaper? What if you're the voters in that person's district? You can say, hey, we've got, you know, 12 percent unemployment. We've got, you know, schools that are that need uh, new supplies. We need new books. We've got, you know, hospitals with problems. And, you know, you're in Italy. Um, you know, that's pretty damning for a for any member of Congress running for reelection. So members of Congress don't want that information out there. Um, so they make it very difficult to to find. December 16, 2009, um, th this is a story, the headline is Congress travels more, public pays, lawmakers ramp up taxpayer finance journeys, five days in Scotland. You lead it off by saying the expenses racked up by U.S. lawmakers traveling here for a conference, <coughs> by the way, it's Dateline Edinburgh, Edinburgh mm -hmm. uh, for a conference last month included one for the, quote, control room, unquote. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Well, uh the journal decided in order to figure out how these trips really work that they'd send me on a trip. So, uh, so I, through a source, uh, found out about an upcoming trip, jumped on a plane, and went to this conference. Um, and uh, got in the same hotel room as the members of Congress and found out that they were all staying on the top floor and everyone has their, you know, their, their nice room and the, one of the nicest hotels there. But then the middle of it, you know, they had the the hotel conference room essentially and they took a couple of adjoining hotel suites and they basically made it into you know a kind of a bar and a and a re relaxation room so they had a couple of computers there so they could you know email and keep in touch with their offices here and they had a they had a bar they had a, uh you know a bunch of newspapers they had a bunch of tvs and stuff they sort of made their own little lounge um and, you know, they say that was for security reasons, so they didn't need to, I guess, go to the hotel bar uh, where I was. You know, they, they could go to their own bar. But did you get um, in that room? No. But you, if you read your article, you get a sense that you're everywhere. Uh, I, I had some good sources on it. Uh, who paid for the bar? Who paid uh, for the room? We did. It's all taxpayer-funded uh, uh, trips. You said that there were 12 legislators on this trip. Uh, do you know some of the names? I'll look for them here. If you don't, I'll, uh, I can remind you. Carol yeah, McCarthy was one. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the John Tanner group? This is the John Tanner trip. And he is a Democrat from Tennessee. Democrat from Tennessee. He's retiring now. Uh, good guy. Uh, was the head of this uh, NATO assembly group, which well, is a... What makes him a good guy, by the way? Uh, you know, he's been around for a long time. Yeah, I think that he's, he's sort of... Uh, I, you know, I said that 99% of members of Congress are good people. I mean, I think that he's one of them. I think that he's trying to do the right thing. Um, he was uh, a part of this um, uh, this group of uh, European uh, parliamentarians and U.S. legislators who, every six months or so, or it's every quarter, they meet up either in the U.S. or abroad. Uh, you said that they call it the NATO parliamentary. Parliamentary group, assembly. But it's not connected to NATO. But it's not part of NATO. And can you explain that? 
Uh, it, it's, it's difficult. Uh, I mean, it, it's a legitimate organization. Um, and the idea is to bring all uh, legislators from NATO countries together on a periodic basis to talk about issues that affect NATO countries. Uh, this one they were talking about uh, Afghanistan and uh, nuclear proliferation. You quote David Scott, the congressman, as saying, so having a spouse travel helps keep the family together, mm -hmm. unquote. What's your reaction to that? Um, a lot of people on Capitol Hill, uh, when I asked them about spouses, spouses traveling, <clears throat> said that, look, these members of Congress are from out in the states. They're not from D.C. They travel to D.C. almost every week. They leave behind their families and their kids. And then once in a while, they get a, they get a break. We get the Easter break. We get the, you know, the spring break, the summer break, and the July 4th. And, and that's the time that members of Congress have the only opportunity that they have to go travel on these uh, you know, official work trips. If they couldn't bring their spouse, they wouldn't be able to go because they haven't, they haven't been able to spend that much time with their spouse. So they say, in order for us to be able to go on these trips, we need to be able to bring our, our spouse. Now, that's the argument. You can decide if you think that's legitimate or not. You say that it was a Sheridan Grand Hotel and Spa in Edinburgh and mm -hmm. that the government rate for the rooms is at least $300 a night. I assume that's what you had to pay. No, I, I think I paid more because they, they had the government. Government, that's right. I didn't have it. Two Air Force liaisons <clears throat> went to a wine and liquor store called mm -hmm. Oddbins. It's probably pronounced differently than that. <laughs> With one aide reading from a shopping list for Scots, they bought three bottles of 12-year-old... Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't whatever. Know. Scotch. Scotch for forty-two dollars a piece, and a bottle of fourteen-year-old something else for fifty-two dollars, mm -hmm. according to the clerk who rang up their order. Mr. Tanner, spokesman, said the group reimbursed the military liaisons. Mm -hmm. But you found, and I don't mean to impugn his motives, but you found here that when they are given money, and this is another story, when they travel overseas, that they're supposed to give the money that's left back, and that they often never do. What's that part of this? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things in this. A lot of elements of this congressional travel uh, series that that it was hard to say if it was right or wrong. Certainly, things that seemed <clears throat> on the border, like whether your you, you members of Congress should have this whole reception area to themselves, whether they should bring their spouses. Well, one of the things we found is that that's just plain wrong is that when members of Congress travel overseas, they're given each day what's called a per diem, you know, a little bit of cash, or actually a, a decent amount of cash, to cover their daily expenses. Um, you know, a lot of companies have per diem uh, for how they uh, uh, fund employees' uh, travel. Well, with members of Congress, um, they never, they, they didn't have to give it back. They didn't have to keep receipts, and they didn't have to give any m money back. Also with members of Congress, uh, they're often going to meals and receptions that are paid for by other people. So in Edinburgh, for example, I think that you get, it's about 250 bucks a day. That's not including your hotel room. So your hotel room's paid for. You get about two hundred fifty bucks a day to cover your your meals and your transportation. Wait, wait, stop there for a second. Yeah. Is it, does that include the money that the military liaisons mm. walk around with in their pocket? No. So they spend all kinds of money themselves when they're escorting that no one tracks in this. On this particular trip uh, that I was following, they were taking a bus every day that was paid for probably by the military or by the U.S. Uh, 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 embassy over there. Uh, they were going to this conference where they were eating at the conference. Um, they went to several receptions at night hosted by the British government and uh, the Scottish government. So they weren't, they weren't going to meals on their own, uh, which means they're piling up this, you know, every day they get another 200, 250 bucks. Um, and at the end of that trip, seven days, no one came to them and, and said, you know, Okay, now give us back the money you didn't spend. You mentioned that they don't have to keep receipts and all that. Why is it, though, every other American through the IRS is required to keep receipts when they're doing business? Have you ever asked them about that? We have not gotten there yet in these stories, but there, there is a significant uh, IRS implication to this. I mean, if you are getting money from the government and not paying taxes on it, that could be a problem. Did they know that you were there in the hotel? No. They just didn't know who you were? Nope. Did you talk to any of them while they were there at the conference? No. I, I kept my head down. I, I, I came with a couple of disguises. I wore hats. I tried to uh, grow a beard. I, uh, um, I'd actually, uh, before going on this trip, had met with a couple of former embassy security people uh, overseas, uh, people who had 
had sort of watched out for our embassies overseas, and they sort of gave me some some counter surveillance techniques, uh, sort of how to stay uh, out of sight. Well, after um, these twelve legislators got back, there's just an interesting thing at the end. I want to ask you mm -hmm. how you got it. I'll read it. The lawmakers, spouses, and aides chatted in front of the Rayburn House office building. They're back mm -hmm. after this trip. Representative Baron Hill, Democrat of Indiana, hugged Georgia Representative Scott's wife and said, quote, it was fun, unquote. Mm -hmm. A spokeswoman for Mr. Hill said the congressman doesn't recall making the comment and could have uh, been, quote, talking about the bus ride, mm -hmm. some random event, or life in general, unquote. <laughs> Mr. Scott's spokesman said Mr. Hill was, quote, just saying goodbye, unquote. Mm -hmm. How'd you get that? Mm -hmm. Well, I was still in Scotland at that point. Uh, the, la the last thing I did on that uh, trip was go to the airport and see them take off in their uh, private uh, U.S. military plane. My colleague Tim Farnham uh, was waiting for them when they arrived. Uh, so, you know, he stood out in front of the, the Rayburn House office building when everyone pulled up and they were unpacking their bags. And, you know, this, this is a, 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 a fun trip, you know. So they had, they were together for seven or ten days, you know, on private planes, uh, staying in the same hotel suite. You know, they certainly got to know each other better. And uh, and Tim just happened to be there and, and snapped a couple photos as they arrived and, and caught sort of the uh, their uh, they were saying goodbye essentially. You write about trips to Jamaica, <laughs> trips to the Galapagos Islands, which you see a lot of. You see for some reason or other they all yeah. go to the Galapagos Islands. Uh, they don't all, but some do. Some. Uh, Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, some of these places. They also go to Afghanistan and Iraq, mm -hmm. and you. You don't talk much about those trips, um, mm -hmm. d but how often did you find them going to Afghanistan, Iraq, and then going off for five days in Italy? Well, that's a really good question. Um, uh, a lot of times that people go to Iraq and Afghanistan, they, they swing through Italy. Now, in Italy, the U.S. has several uh, uh, military bases, so it's either a convenient excuse or, or a good excuse, depending on how you look at it. Uh, the one trip that you mentioned earlier that Nancy Pelosi went on, uh, she spent seven days in Italy a couple years ago. Well, that was all based around a, a one-day trip to Afghanistan. Uh, so it's very easy to come back and say, you know, I just went and visited the troops, and, uh, you know, people in the country think that's a really good thing, and you don't mention, you know, oh, by the way, I also spent seven days in, in Italy. Is there any place that people can w read all of your stories? Uh, WSJ.com. Um, WSJ, Wall Street Journal dot com. WSJ.com. Is and that a, a, do you have to pay? Uh, I, I think some of these stories are behind the paywall and some may not be. Uh, the journal is in the process of, of changing ha how they uh, charge people for stories online. Um, eventually everything will be paid for. Uh, everything will be behind the paywall. Right now, some are in and some are And some how are many free people at the journal do what you're doing? Uh, f uh, a year ago at this point, um, there were four in D.C. and now there's just me. Is that because of the obvious? One of them, unfortunately, passed away, uh, and the other two uh, left. They did. They just sort of thought, thought it was time to, to move on. Where did you start? Where did you start your life? Uh, I grew up in Washington D.C., uh, and that has many advantages. One is that you're sort of exposed to D.C. and how it works, and and also that you have uh, you know connections and relationships through your family and. And your friends, parents, and what were your parents doing here in this town? Both my parents worked for the for the government. Uh, my dad worked for the Federal Communications Commission, uh, and my mom was a uh, computer person who did government contracting in some weird and complicated way that I still don't understand. Where did you go to college? Uh, I went to Northwestern University out in Chicago. Uh, I always knew I wanted to be a reporter, and that was a good way of of getting uh, a good background. And then I came back to D.C. and and, and dove in. Was that the Medill School? I did not go to the Medill School. Uh, I was an economics major. I actually had, uh, you know, through the, the, my fortunate background, uh, did a, a sort of volunteer position at the Wall Street Journal's Washington Bureau in 1992 when I was in high school during uh, Bill Clinton's famous election. And back then, you know, there was a bunch of senior uh, journal reporters and I said, you know, what should I do? And they said, don't major in journalism. They said, if you want to cover medicine, go to med school. If you want to cover science, you know, be a biology major. And if you want to cover Washington, uh, major in economics or poli sci or history. But uh, their advice was, was not to major. What did you major in? Economics. And what year did you graduate? 1996. 
You work for Com Daily, Communications Daily. Right. You work for uh, the um, roll call, but you also work for Congress Con Daily. Congress Daily. Yeah. Uh, what year did you go to work again for the Wall Street Journal? Two thousand five. And how did and eventually? How, why did do you think they hired you there? Um, I, at roll call, I uh, tried to write the type of stories that the journal likes writing, which is sort of the intersection of business and politics. Uh, how companies, uh, what what do companies want in Washington, and how do they get it? Uh, most reporters in Washington cover uh, Capitol Hill and politics, and the uh, and the and the uh, you know what lawmakers do without looking at the the influence uh, that they're receiving from business. My job is sort of cover that business influence, um, and those are you know for the Wall Street Journal, a big business newspaper. Uh, I think they were attracted to that. One of the things in one of your stories that, that um, you got these documents, I guess, through the Freedom of Information Act, and I'm just going to read this and get it. We haven't got much time to explain it. The documents also reveal what the Army aimed to gain from its assistance, meaning assisting this travel overseas. Correspondence dated November 25th, 2008, between Army officials whose names were blocked out noted the trip's objectives. One, establish a personal connection between the Army and Senator Dodd's office. Two, create member access through relationships. Three, educate members of Congress on the FCS, a reference to the Future Combat Systems, right. a multi-billion dollar modernization program favored by the Army that was killed this year by the Pentagon. This is inside government using taxpayer money to try to influence members to continue spending taxpayer dollars on the military institutions. It's completely fascinating. I'm glad that you, you picked up on that. It's, it's a, one of those areas I, I wish we've been able to pursue further, and maybe we will down the road. So, you know, these members of Congress want to travel. It's something that, you know, they say their, their spouses like. It's, it's good for their family lives. It's, it's fun. It, it helps them become a better lawmaker. Um, but the way they travel is that the Air Force and the military uh, and the State Department you know, bend over backwards to treat these guys like royalty, you know, and women when they're overseas. They fly in these, uh, these, these Air Force planes, and these are not Air Force fighter jets, or they're not in the back of, you know, in the hull of some, you know, big transport plane. They're flying on all business class 737s, all business class uh, uh, 757s, that's Air Force Two, um, really fancy planes. Their bags are carried for them, limos pick them up and drop them off. Um, you know, they have security everywhere they go. And for the, long, for the longest time, we thought, why is the military doing this? What is the military getting? And then we found these documents where in this internal uh, Air Force, uh, or I think it was an Air Force or Navy form, you know, the, the Navy people have to justify why they're helping these members of Congress. And for each trip, it would say, objective of the, of the trip. And in this form, they said, the objective is to establish a relationship with Senator Dodd and get him to vote for our lobbying priority. At a time, you gonna write a book? Maybe. <laughs> Rody Mullins of the Wall Street Journal, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me, this was great. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.